Mm -hmm. uh, welcome this afternoon to our SAVE lecture, which is the fourth one of this um, particular year. And uh, we're happy to be able to do Zooming with uh, our lectures because of the COVID and because it enabled us to, to uh, see different people and um, uh, uh, introduce people from uh, different countries, et cetera. So that is really good. Our SAVE organization is uh, about uh, over 30 years old. Uh, we've been giving lectures uh, for this amount of time, at least five a year, to be able to educate our public. And uh, SAVE is um, uh, bringing together sustainability, spirituality, and ecology. And that is our goal. We sponsor a number of different things. SAVE stands for the Science Alliance for Valuing the Environment. We uh, do these um, public lectures bi-monthly. Uh, we provide scholarships to underserved students, uh, use for, for science camps, uh, provide special environmental awards at Northwest District Science Day. And four of our staff people, our members, have just um, have just judged science fair on Saturday. Sunday we met on Zoom and we chose three wonderful students, a seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. So we're happy about that. We present environmental awards at the annual awards night, which is usually in May. We have to adjust a little bit because of COVID. Uh, we put out a quarterly newsletter and we sell honey and maple syrup produced locally here for our um, fundraising event. Um, John, can you go to the next slide? Okay. We have a number of corporate donors that you'll see here. Budget Blinds, the Baha'i of Sylvania, Luber Plate, Sophia Center, Lourdes University, Lake Erie Waterkeeper, with just a brand new uh, co-sponsor, co um, the Catholic Holy Spirit Community, the Butterfly House, Wild Birds Unlimited, the Sylvania Franciscans, of which Sister Sharon and I are members, and the Wright Financial Group. We also partner with a lot of other groups. Uh, at this point in time, we have, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 of them. So uh, we really feel that um, we're, we're trying to make a difference, bringing people together, uh, encouraging them to do some research on their own. So this is wonderful. Um, we record our lectures. They'll be on the YouTube site for our organization. And we have a new website, www.sciencealliancesave.org. You can go to there and find the events that we have. And um, if you go to the calendar, on, on this website, you will always see the lectures and what their link is right away. So you, you have um, that information on hand. I would like to present Ken Ilgunas. And he, I don't know if I said the name right, Ken, but he is um, going to talk today about trespassing across America. One man's epic, never done before, and sort of illegal hike along the Keystone Pipeline. And uh, today on the news at noon, they talked about the Keystone Pipeline. So you might catch it on the news this evening. Let me tell you a little bit about Ken. He is an author, a journalist, a backcountry ranger in Alaska. He was, has hitchhiked 10,000 miles across North America paddled 1,000 miles across Ontario in a birch bark canoe and walked 1,700 miles across the Great Plains. Following the proposed route of the Keystone Pipeline, um, period, he's written for uh, the New York Times, the Time Magazine, Backpacker, Smithsonian Magazine, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. I also saw him on the Nature Conservancy um, in, the, in their booklet that they put out. And I was reading about this person who did all this great stuff. And then I said, I wonder who that person is. And I go back 
and there's Ken's name. So <laughs> I got introduced to him a long time before here. His adventures and books have been featured on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, The New Yorker, National Geographic, and NPR. He has a BA from SUNY Buffalo in History and English and an MA in Liberal Studies from Duke. He is the author of Travel Memoirs, Walden on Wheels and Trespassing Across America, and an advocacy book, The Land is This Land is Our Land. He's from Wheatfield, New York, but is presently living with his wife and his young daughter in Dunbar, Scotland. So I'd like to present to you Ken. Thank you, Ken. You're on. on. Excellent. Hello. Can you can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Um, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be speaking for SAVE. And yes, I'm calling from Scotland. I hope no one was expecting some sexy Scottish voice, not that Scottish accents are sexy or anything. No, just a typical uh, Western New York accent here. The only thing unique about Scotland here is the fact that I'm wearing my, my coat. All these Scottish homes are, are drafty and I'm doing everything I can to save on my own energy bills, which are, are soaring right now here mm -hmm. in the, the British Isles. Um, but speaking of energy, I, I wanna talk to you about this journey I went on a few years ago. And uh, you kind of have to get into my headspace. So this is what I was thinking. I was thinking the oceans are rising. The storms are strengthening. The climate refugees are fleeing. The droughts are coming. The planet is warming. What are you going to do about it? What is your duty as a citizen of this world up against something as enormous as climate change? How far should you go to protect your planet? These were the questions on my mind a few years ago. <clears throat> I, I didn't wanna sit on the sidelines anymore. I wanted to do something. Um, I wasn't sure what that something was, but I, I decided I'd pick kind of one small part of this very big problem. I chose a pipeline, a massively controversial pipeline. It was called the Keystone XL, which stretches from Alberta, Canada to the Gulf Coast of Texas. And I had to ask, my, ask myself, how am I going to engage with this pipeline? Am I going to do it just the normal way? Am I going to go you know, hold a sign up in, in, in Washington, D.C.? Am I going to, you know, try to educate my, my friends, inspire my friends on, on Facebook? Am I going to call my politicians? Those are all worthy and important things to do, but I, I wanted to do something more. I wanted to go beyond the normal things. And I just like, looked at myself and I thought, what could I bring to this? And I thought of the things I was good at and I loved hiking and I loved writing and I thought you know what what if I actually walked the proposed route of this Keystone XL and wrote about it and shared and perhaps earned a voice on this issue but you had to ask yourself how do you even walk a 1700 mile pipeline it's not like the Appalachian Trail where thousands of people have done it and, uh, you know, there's guidebooks and stuff like that. Pipelines, they don't follow roads. Pipelines, they don't parallel hiking paths. Pipelines like to take the shortest route they can to get to their refinery. This means that pipelines go across grasslands. They go across croplands. They go across private property. So this meant if I wanted to faithfully hike, faithfully follow this pipeline, I'd have to walk across Alberta Prairie, Saskatchewan Pasture, Montana Hills, South Dakota Canyons, Nebraska Cornfields, Kansas, Oklahoma, all the way down to Texas. In other words, to follow this pipeline, I would have to trespass across America. And I found that thrilling. Uh, 
Let me turn my, my slides on here. Just give me a second. I'm not being with you right now. Hold on, where'd my slides go? Here they are. Can you see them okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, terrific. Um, well, let me make sure I can turn them. There we go. Okay, so let me tell you uh, more about where I got this idea from. I was living in a very strange place. I was living in Dead Horse, Alaska, the tippy top of Alaska. This is in the middle of the Prudhoe Bay oil fields. Um, it, it would take a, another whole slideshow to uh, tell you about how I ended up in Dead Horse, but I was, I was broke and desperate for money. Uh, this is Dead Horse right here. This is what Dead Horse looks like. Dead Horse is quite possibly the most miserable place in, in North America. <laughs> it's um, equipment, it's oil, it's a labor camp, it's dudes. There are a lot of dudes in Dead Horse. There's a nine to one male to female ratio here. And I'm, I'm sure some of the ladies are thinking, you know, I could go to Dead Horse and I'll have some options up there. But before you do that, we have a, a saying up in Alaska and that's um, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. And that's definitely the case with, with Dead Horse. So at this point I'm 28 and I'm broke and I'm washing dishes for a living. Um, up in this, this labor camp. And I can say from experience, when you're 28 and broke and washing spoon after spoon in the middle of the night in a silent kitchen in an Arctic labor camp 250 miles north of the Arctic Circle, you begin to question the direction your life is headed in. Uh, <laughs> um, but I can say this also from experience this is what i learned from it is it's sometimes when you're in your pit of despair when you feel like you're living without purpose and meaning that's when the crazy ideas start to flood into your brain that's when you get all this inspiration that's when you're most ready to commit to something big make a big change in your life and find that something that brings you meaning and purpose <clears throat> and my buddy Liam, who was the cook, um, I'd wash dishes, he'd cook, and we talked all the time. And after our shifts, we'd go into the um, communal lounge and watch TV. And we were watching all these people protesting this pipeline, this Keystone XL pipeline. They were going to DC, they were uh, putting their bodies on the line, they were being hauled away to jail. And we just kind of looked at ourselves and we just felt so purposeless. Like, not only that, but we were working for the oil industry. And two environmentalists working for an industry we had very uh, unpleasant feelings about. And we just, the next, the next day, uh, Ewan was cooking and I was scrubbing out this potato soup bowl. And he just looks at me and says, like, what if we were to hike it? And I looked at him and I just dropped the bowl in the sink. And it was just one of those moments, those few moments in your life where it's just like a lightning bolt. It's just like, it's not, that's not just a good idea. That's what I must do. And I said, we must, we must hike the Keystone XL. Um, so things started to look up for me uh, after this. I hey, hitchhiked out of Dead Horse. I got a book deal for something, for a book unrelated to anything to do with the Keystone XL. So I had some money. I was out of Dead Horse. I was living in Denver with my friend, but I wanted to hold on to that flash of inspiration. I wanted to remember it because it's easy to forget those things when you know, you're out of your rock bottom and things are good. I wanted to hold on and remember it and follow through with it. Um, so um, yeah, so I started preparing. <laughs> I bought a thousand dollars worth of food. I, I researched how these Appalachian Trail through hikers do it. And what they do is they, they buy all their food beforehand, box it up, and then that, like their mom will mail um, a box of food to post offices along their route. I've learned a, a thing or two about nutrition 
since um, I took this hike and I would not try to hike across the country on Cheetos and peanut butter again. <laughs> um, so I would, I would carry different stuff. Here's me mixing up a, a giant box of, of trail mix. Uh, and yeah, here's my boxes. So each one of those boxes contains about five to seven days worth of food. And my buddy, Josh in Denver, he was kind of my base camp. So I would email him and he'd mail these boxes to post offices along my, my route. Uh, again, there's no like Appalachian trail um, guidebook on how to do this. No one has ever hiked this route before. So I had to figure out how to do it myself and mapping was like a big question mark for me. But I just said, um, I, I bought this uh, mapping software program called Topo um, by National Geographic. And I produced about 75 topic, topographic maps for myself. So when I was hiking, I'd usually be carrying um, a compass in one hand and one of these topographic maps in the other. I did a bunch of um, hiking shopping for, for my for my hike that's the only sort of shopping i actually enjoy doing and buying all this fun gear um, you can see what can you see on the bottom there you can see some aqua mirror drops that would purify my water um, for protection i brought a knife and a canister of bear spray that's what that red cylinder thing is closer to the top um, that, that's shown some effectiveness in deterring charging bears. I wasn't expecting to see any sort of bears, but when I lived up in Alaska, that thing always made me feel slightly more at ease. So I just thought if I have a problem with a person or a dog or whatever, at least I have something. Uh, I brought uh, a med kit, compass and a headlamp so I could see in, in the dark. I researched this kind of somewhat faddish style of hiking called ultralight hiking. <clears throat> and I tried to go as light as possible, everything from wearing like super light trail running shoes to this tent. This, this is called a tarp tent. It weighs about a pound and a half, whereas your typical tent weighs more like four or five pounds. It's held upright by trekking poles. In the end, after this hike, I, I have some big um, skepticism over ultralight hiking. But um, yeah, I went into it with that gear. This was a big sacrifice of weight here, what you see. In this slide, that's an iPad generation three, uh, a Pelican case and a keyboard. I, I wanted this to be a public hike. This wasn't just for me, just for fun. Like I wanted to be able to share it and perhaps gain an audience and perhaps gain a voice. I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to do all that, but I knew I wanted to be able to write somewhat comfortably in my tent. And this technologically made the most sense for me, uh, given <clears throat> the available technology at the time. So that's me on the day before my hike. That's about 45 pounds on my I know what these my guys. <laughs> uh, in, <clears throat> in Denver, Colorado. If you look at my feet, and there's going to be more um, foot shots, luckily, in this slideshow program, but <laughs> you can see a bandage over uh, one of them. So I was just walking down my friend's basement steps as I was, you know, organizing this trip and I tripped over the steps and I heard this awful snap and I fell down onto the bed and my face was just sweating. And I was like, did I just break my toe right before I'm going to set off on this almost 2000 mile hike? And I was just laying there thinking, why would I do that? And I was just like, was that my subconscious kind of like laying booby traps and trying to tell me can don't go on this trip by sacrificing negligible body parts. So I felt like I was almost at war with some part of myself that I couldn't even perceive. Um, and to this day, I'm not sure if that was the case, but I've never broken a toe and I've never broken one since. It was very odd that I broke it right before I was supposed to um, go on this hike. One small problem though, my buddy Liam from Dead Horse at the last minute, he gives he, he he calls me and he says, Ken, there's a problem. I remember that I, I'm banned from Canada. <laughs> um, so this meant that it's gonna be a solo hike. I'm going to have to go on my own. Let me tell you a bit about my route and the pipeline 
here. So um, <clears throat> follow that yellow dashed line from north to south. That, that's, that starts in Hardesty, Alberta. That's like a, a pipeline hub. There's a whole bunch of oil equipment. The, the actual oil comes from north of Hardesty, and we'll get to that in a second. But the proposed route of the Keystone XL was this yellow dashed line, which goes through Montana, the Dakota, uh, South Dakota, Nebraska. Then it enters into a pre-existing pipeline uh, on the Kansas border. And that pre-existing pipeline is called the Keystone One. And that was built in 2009-ish. Um, so the Keystone XL would pump into that, come out in Cushing, Oklahoma. And then there's a second portion of the Keystone XL, which goes from Cushing to Port Arthur, Texas. And Port Arthur is a refinery town. Lots of oil gets sent there. It gets refined into uh, distillates, into diesel, and um, some of it ends up in domestic markets. A lot of it's shipped to South America, Europe, or, 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 or China. Um, so that's, that's the, the makeup of it. The, the second, the, the bottom part of the Keystone XL, that's actually in the ground. That was put in in 2012. The contested Keystone XL, the very controversial, is that more northern section from Hardesty to Steel City. That's more controversial because it crosses an international border. And when you have a public works project cross an international border like a pipeline, you need State Department approval for it to go through. You need in other words, you need presidential approval. So environmentalists saw this and like they saw this as an opportunity because to get a project like this halted and to perhaps win a symbolic victory against the fossil fuel industry, you don't need to convince your state legislature. You don't need to convince Congress. All you need to do is convince one man and that was the president of the United States. So the Keystone XL, we can talk about um, it's, it's uh, how it's evolved over the years and how it was used as a political football and denied and brought back to life and resurrected and killed and all that um, later on. So that's what the um, Keystone XL pipe would look like. That's a big pipe. That's 36 inches in diameter. And like almost all oil pipelines, it would be buried beneath the ground. What's flowing through it? This isn't your, your granddaddy's sort of oil. It's not crude oil, which, you know, historically we, we just kind of um, inject a big steel straw into the earth and suck up this crude oil. That's not this stuff at all. Um, as oil is becoming a bit more scarce and harder to get to, we've had to um, seek different sorts of oil. This is uh, called oil sands, tar sands. It's kind of the consistency of tar. It smells like tar. Uh, it's not tar. It's the consistency of like peanut butter. Um, a more technical name for it is bitumen. Bitumen is a mixture, and this is what you're looking at, clay, water, sand, and oil. Now, where is this? It's in this orange area up here in um, northern Alberta. This is a massive area. It doesn't look big, but if you look at Alberta, it's a massive province. Um, so <clears throat> the tar sand sits beneath the surface of 54,000 square miles of boreal forest up in northern Alberta and Saskatchewan. So what happens is you to get the stuff again you don't just stick a straw into the ground you have to bulldoze the boreal forest you have to dig up this bitumen and you have to refine it on spot just so you can be able to send it down a pipeline so you mix a, a bunch of chemicals Thank you mix you. some hot water into it Thank you. and you're Thank able you. to send it down a pipeline. Then it's called, not bitumen, it's called diluted bitumen or dilbit. And I'm sure we've all heard that term before, dilbit. And dilbit's running through a number of pipelines right now. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this hike and I'm thinking, you know, I'm gonna spend the next many months on this hike. It would be wrong to not see the oil, the source of this oil. So, um, I decide I need to go to Northern Alberta. I need to see 
the tar sands. So I didn't know how I was going to get up to Northern Alberta, but I just kind of stuck out my thumb and I hitchhiked 1000 miles over the course of 10 days. And I got to Fort McMurray, which is kind of the working camp. And I was like looking for the, the tar sands. You can't see it from the ground. So I bought a $200 um, uh, tour, a, a flight tour of the area. And this is what I'm flying over at first. This is the boreal forest. This is one of the more untouched parts of it. It's um, spruce trees and birch trees and moose and wood bison and black bears and beavers and palms and they call them muskeg swamp. Um, it's, it's beautiful. It, it smells like Halloween um, and it's just this beautiful, amazing ecosystem. And then I begin to fly over the industrialized area. This is what's called a tailings pond, more like a tailings lake because it's enormous and there's many of them. So you may remember when I just described what happens, you dig up this stuff from the ground and you refine it kind of on spot, but you need to kind of put all the gunk, all the chemicals and water and sand and clay. That's why they've built these, these tailings, tailing ponds and um, they're, they're not good. I mean, when you fly over them, they're like, there's a sheen to it. And the poor migratory birds, they don't know any better. So they land on them and they, and they die. And some of the workers actually do care about, you know, um, habitat or what's left of the habitat. So they'll post these scarecrows wearing hazmat suits in the middle of the pond, which they call bitchu men. It's a, it's a strange place. And then I'm flying, it, it was just so bizarre flying over this place. It was so unreal. I, I, these huge fields of, of blackness, this is um, called coke or pet coke, petroleum coke. This is a byproduct from the refining process. And this, uh, and this can be burned as like a secondary fossil fuel, much like we burn coal. And then it just kept getting weirder and weirder. I felt like these yellow pyramids um, sulfur is a byproduct from the refining process. So they're just kind of building these yellow sulfur pyramids up into the sky. This is what it really looks like. This is what it looks like from almost one edge of the horizon to the other when you're above the tar sand. It's this enormous mud pit where for decades they've been digging out this substance. And I remember thinking, wow, this is amazing. This is huge. And I told the pilot this when he landed and he's like, we were flying for like an hour and a half. And he's like, we barely got to even see it. This was 10% of the pit mining operation. And pit mining is only about half of the extraction methods to get this stuff out. So what we're talking about here could arguably be the worst human-made environmental disaster in our, in our history, what, what's happening up in the, the tar sands right now. So a pipeline, <coughs> excuse me, a pipeline like the Keystone XL, it would contribute to the expansion of this area. It would contribute to our continued dependence on fossil fuels. It would contribute to um, the greenhouse gases we emit, which affects climate change. So I think environmentalists, and I'm including myself here, we were revved up about this Keystone XL and we wanted to make a stand. We wanted to make a, a statement. Uh, we wanted to do something. So that brings me to my walk. I hitchhike a, a few uh, days down to Hardesty, Alberta, and I walk roads for the first couple of days. And then I begin my trespassing hike to stay faithful to this um, proposed route. And I got to say, walking over the Alberta Prairie, uh, there's like no better hiking ground. It's, it's amazing. It's beautiful. We think of the plains as flat and boring, but it's just outstandingly glorious and beautiful. And yeah, my socks would fill up with grass seeds every day and i'd step on the occasional cactus yes there's cactus all the way up in canada but otherwise it's just glorious terrain to be walking over 
I can see on like a small hill, you can see to the arc of the earth, which is about 22 miles. And 22 miles is actually a, a, a good hiking day. It's a, you can, it's a reasonable hiking day. So I used to think maybe I could hike a horizon a day. Um, so yeah, there's another foot shot. So um, I think to myself, like this is a pretty stupid time to be starting my hike. I'm starting this in late September in Canada and it's going to be like cold in Montana soon. So I think to myself, I got to move fast. So I think I, I can do 20 miles a day and I could knock this hike out in a hundred days and maybe I won't get hit by a really hard winter, but yeah, you can see what's coming. Um, by day three, my feet are an absolute mess. I'm not exaggerating when I say these feet have eight blisters on the bottoms of them. The backs of my ankles are completely rubbed off. Um, I, I have this like uh, um, rash on the tops of my feet, which just turns out to be athletes. This is way too much information about my feet. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I have athletes feet and uh, I just start, I, I ran out of moleskin, which hikers would know you put on your emerging blisters. I ran out of moleskin after day two. So I just started wrapping duct tape around my feet, which does nothing good for your feet at all. Please do not, please do not do that. Um, it just made them look completely ridiculous. Um, and for the first couple of weeks, I'm walking in an almost constant state of fear. I'm, I'm worried about winter coming. Winter is on my heels. I'm, I'm worried about landowners. I'm, again, I'm walking over fields. I'm walking over grass. I'm walking over private property. Am I going to get shot for doing what I'm doing? And I'm terrified of all these cows because I'm a suburbanite who's never been near a cow or milked a cow or, you know, um, than anything with a cow. And I just knew that these things were bigger than me and faster than me. And they had horns and they chased people through Spain and they gored bullfighters. So yeah, I might come across a nasty one. And um, I remember when I was hitchhiking north um, to get to my hiking route, this lady, Doris from Montana, she picks me up and she says she's a cattle rancher. And like, okay, I got a, a cow expert with me. I can ask her all my cow related questions. And I'm like, Doris, what happens if the cows attack me? And she says, she gives me this like really like suspicious look at first. And she says, you know, they're vegetarian, right? And um, it's like, yeah, I'm not a complete idiot, Doris. Yes, I know they're not vegetarian. But what do they do if I get charged by one? Because I'm going to be walking past tens of thousands of them. And she says, <coughs> if I'm charged by a bull, just look them in the eye and talk to them manly. And she looked at me and she saw how that gave me no reassurance whatsoever. And she, said, she then said, if they charge you, just, just step to the side of them. You can keep doing that and tire them out. And that was the scariest piece of advice I'd ever been given by anybody. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm scared, but I'm figuring stuff out too. Rather than you know trying to hike 20 miles a day, I need to let my body ease into it. So I'm doing eight miles a day. I'm doing 10 miles a day. I'm, I'm washing my feet religiously. I'm washing my socks all the time. Um, I'm, I'm taking days off. I'm learning how to navigate. I'm, I'm getting good with my compass and my maps. I'm noticing like little signs like these that were, that show like where the Keystone one pipeline is and the Keystone one would kind of parallel the proposed route of the Keystone XL. So I knew if I was on the Keystone one for the first couple hundred miles, I was heading in the right direction. And or like, you know, like those big kind of orange balls that you see in electrical lines over over roadways. I'm sure you have that in, in, in Ohio. And um, yeah, that usually indicates where there's a pipeline going beneath the ground. So if I saw one of those, <coughs> you know, 10 miles away, I knew if I just headed right towards it, I wouldn't waste a step. I'd use every step efficiently. 
Uh, as for camping, like I didn't know like how I was going to sleep or, or, or camp on, on people's lands or whatnot. And I just kind of had this policy of, I, d- I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. So I'm just going to hide myself every single night. And sometimes this was setting up my tent in kind of like a hollow in between agricultural fields. South, South Dakota was very easy because South Dakota can be can- kind of canyon-esque. So I would just go to the bottom of the canyon where no one would see me. But this is the Great Plains. Um, there's not a lot of tree cover where I would normally try to like, hide my tent. And I, I show this picture because I was walking for several hours and that's as many trees as I could find. It's not that they're, the farmers are like cutting down these trees. The Great Plains get so little annual precipitation. It can support grasslands, but it can't really support forests. It gets, it gets some places get well under 20 inches a year so uh, and in fact you know in in maps a 19th century maps of the great plains it was actually called the great american desert um which i was walking over which would mean make finding water difficult the wind it blew so hard there's nothing to obstruct the wind over the plains so i would try to find any sort of buffer i could such as this abandoned shack in montana um this i, I got hit by a blizzard in south dakota um Whenever I'd go into a town, I'd, I'd go onto my iPad and check my emails. And then I checked the weather to see if anything was anything nasty was coming and nothing nasty was coming, but <clears throat> I was walking and all of a sudden these snowflakes fell and then a lot of snowflakes. And then I find myself in the middle of this blizzard and I can't see in front of me. And I just happened across this abandoned barn where this big barred owl flew out of that top window and I felt so bad for that owl because I was displacing it but I would I would move into that barn for the next couple of nights as I waited out this this storm the cows actually weren't as bad as I thought they would be cows are just kind of scaredy cat for the most part and I would hop off a fence like this 30 times a day and come across you know big herds of 50 or 100 cattle and they'd be eating their grass and they'd see me and they'd all kind of stop and they'd have like grass coming out the sides of their mouth and then one scaredy cat would run away and then all 100 cows would run away and here I am just like 175 pounds scaring away 50,000 pounds and you can't help but feel a little powerful when (laughs) that happens. For water, again the Great Plains is is a very arid part of our country so um, I'd rely on ponds, uh, creeks i'd use my my water purifier um, or these things uh, i didn't know what these were before i started my hike i just figured they're just kind of like decoration for the prairie but th- uh, they actually serve a, pr- a purpose um they're, they're windmills windmill springs so this is how you uh, hydrate cattle over very arid part of this country so the wind blows it pumps up water from the ground the water goes into a trough the cows drink out of the trough ken drinks out of the trough with the cows and that's kind of how i would hydrate myself so i'd have to fill up but once a day on on one of these things Um, but sometimes i wouldn't see i wouldn't have any source of of water to fill up my three water bottles and that was my opportunity to, to meet folks I would go up to this lonely house on the prairie, um, knock on their door. And I said, this must have been like a hundred times. Hello, my name's Ken. I'm on a walk across the country. Could I trouble you for some water? And that was my opening. That's, that's how I was making connections on this trip. That's how I was able to talk about the things that really mattered to me, whether it was pipelines or environmentalism or climate change. So this guy, his name's Carl. Um, up in Alberta, he's a, a, a farmer. And I asked him, once I got to know him, I asked him, like, what do you think of this Keystone XL? I know it's supposed to go through your, your land. And he pointed the, to the Keystone 1 pipeline. And he says, you see that? You know, that pipeline's going through my land as well. That's the best thing that, that's ever happened to me. He said he was generously compensated. It had only been in the ground for a few years, but there had yet to be a leak. Um, he said it provided a boost to the local economy. This is what I heard again and again um, in Alberta 
in Saskatchewan. I didn't really come across any sort of kind of pipeline skepticism. And it's just, it's just such a, a normal and routine part of life for the folks in that part of Canada. I mean, you see pipelines everywhere. You see the pipeline signs everywhere. You see those pump jacks, you know, those nodding donkeys in fields. You see those just all over. Someone like Carl has probably, as a, you know, fresh out of high school, 18 or 19, he went up in the tar sands and worked up there for a few years and made a, a boatload of money and then came back down to the farm. That's just normal. So when you ask them, what do you think of this Keystone XL pipeline? They're just like, oh, just another pipeline. Um, that was kind of just my, my general impressions of the, the Canadians I spoke with. When I crossed the border into Montana, I began to see some resistance, gentle resistance, not necessarily for environmental reasons, but more for like private property reasons. Like my great granddaddy homesteaded this land a hundred years ago, and now this foreign corporation, Trans Canada wants to jam a pipeline in my land, you know, no, no thank you. So I would see some kind of objections on private property grounds. It wasn't until the state of Nebraska where I saw some serious resistance <coughs> to it. In Nebraska, the, I guess the one thing different about Nebraska from the rest of these Great Plains states is they have water. They have the Ogallala Aquifer, which underlies almost the whole state of Nebraska. That's where um, about 85% of Nebraska's drinking water comes from. Nebraska is a, a, a huge agricultural state, so they're growing tons of corn, tons of soybeans, and you need water. You need to irrigate, and the Ogallala Aquifer provides that. So they were thinking this, this pipeline, which is this strange sort of oil mixed with a whole bunch of chemicals, some very toxic, like, like benzene, is going to come through our water supply. What happens if there's a leak, and there is very often a leak in these pipelines? Is that going to corrupt this precious supply for, for, for everybody? So I met this guy, Rick Hammond. Um, he's a farmer and a rancher. He grows corn and soybeans. He has about I think a hundred head of cattle. And uh, he has the pipeline set to go through his family's land. And he said he felt so bullied by the pipeline company, by the land agents who came to his door and you know negotiated with them. And they they they'd come and sit down and they said, you know, Rick, this is this is your chance. Here's X amount of money. I don't know how much it was, maybe let's say $25,000, um, just a, a one-time payment. You can take this payment now, um, or you know, if you're going to put up a fight, we're going to declare eminent domain. The pipeline's still going to go through your land, and you're not going to get anything, which isn't exactly true. He would have had to get something if eminent domain was, was claimed. But he didn't know any better, and Rick's not a a dumb guy and he he signed that contract and he said it was the worst thing worst worst decision he's ever made and this is something i also heard a lot talking with landowners just feeling really bullied by the by the pipeline company and i have to say like i was really impressed with the farmers i met you know they're not i think kind of the stereotype of a farmer is someone who's hardworking, but you know, maybe not like the brightest person, but I, I found them super smart because to be like a modern day farmer, you have to know about like the, what's happening in the Chinese economy. You have to know about your own domestic politics. You have to know about soil quality and aquifer levels and how to negotiate with this big seed company. You're basically a farmer and a businessman, but when you go out to these lonely towns in South Dakota or Nebraska, and you know you have a, a rural lawyer there who's never dealt with anything like this before, who's never negotiated a contract with a pipeline company, 
you're just completely by yourself. Not only that, but you have to sign a non-disclosure contract, which means you don't even know what your neighbor is being compensated for. You don't know if they've negotiated for like a, a deeper pipe or a stronger pipe or whatever. So you're completely clueless. <coughs> the only reason Nebraska was able to put up a better fight than the rest of the states is they began to kind of coalesce. They formed into this, a, a couple organizations. One was called Bold Nebraska, which is still around. The other was called the CIA, the Cowboy and Indian Alliance. So you had people fighting for either private property and envi environmental rights, people who you wouldn't normally kind of expect to be fighting those fights, whether it's ranchers or cowboys or, or, or anything or, or things like that. So Rick decided to join me on my hike. And I thought, you know, is this, is this it? Is this the beginning of my movement? Is this my like Forrest Gump moment where I'm going to have like hundreds of bearded people, uh, <laughs> you know, joining me on my walk across America? But no, it was just Rick. And he only lasted four days. I was in really good hiking condition at that point, And he was not, but we got across the state of Nebraska together, which we're both very pleased with. And it was a complete success. He had all of his sisters-in-law call up local media, Nebraskan TV, Nebraskan newspapers, radio. So we were being interviewed two or three times a day. We were like celebrities in, in Nebraska. And just something about like this middle-aged farmer rancher and this idealist from, from the East Coast. It was just kind of uh, for the media, uh, a match made in, in heaven. And I have to, I, I had to say at this point about halfway through my journey, like it's working. Um, I don't know how, but it's, it's, it's working. I'm blogging. I'm getting all these interviews. And then suddenly like the New York times sends me an email. They want to do an interview. Mother Jones, Huffington post, Canada's biggest TV network, CBC News, they brought out a film crew over just to, to film me on, on a day of my walk. And by doing something kind of bold, by doing something kind of zany, by doing something that captured people's imaginations, I was able to, to gain a voice that I otherwise would not have had. And I just kind of sat back and said, okay, it was worth it. It would have been worth it even if I didn't get that because the hike is amazing, but it was, it was extra worth it now that I was able to kind of further the conversation in my own way. Now, granted, I wasn't lighting the internet on fire or anything, but in my own small way, I felt like I was doing something. But I have to say just, just one more thought on kind of my interactions with, with folks. I, I can't tell you just how much, like I, I expected to see kind of a lot more resistance to this pipeline, given kind of the media atmosphere that I <clears throat> lived in. But I just saw so much indifference. Just people were just kind of okay and complacent about this pipeline. They're just like, oh, it's just another pipeline. Climate change, I mean, that is a, dirty word in some parts of the country and bringing up the topic of climate change even in the midst of a historic drought it only rained or snowed on me 11 days during the course of my my hike it was so difficult and so contentious and you would just kind of see someone's face turn red when you when you bring it up because you triggered them in some way um, and i can't tell you how much kind of vitriolic denial I saw people who just would just say oh that that liberal hoax or that government conspiracy like you don't believe in that do you like yeah I, I do I do believe in in climate change and I have some theories why denial exists uh, in, in America climate change denial and maybe we can talk about in the in the Q&A let me just kind of keep moving along with my walk here but yeah, so, you know, again, I'm from the suburbs of, of Buffalo, New York, so I'm used to kind of forests and, and rivers and 
subdivisions and industrial cities. I'm not used to this. This was an alien landscape to me. But by the time I reached Montana, by the time I had a couple hundred miles behind me, I, I, I weirdly felt at home. I felt at home on the prairie. I felt at home on the Great Plains. This place is just so beautiful and underappreciated and undervisited. And I'd, go, I'd, I'd grown used to the coyotes chattering outside of my tent every night. I was getting used to seeing dark skies full of stars. I was getting used to seeing these big herds of, of deer just soaring across the prairie. I'd see pronghorn almost every day. Pronghorn's the fastest mammal in North America. It evolved to flee the American cheetah when this continent had a cheetah hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago. And when you see six of them running 60 miles an hour, sucking oxygen down their throats, just leaping over barbed wire fences, it's just stunning. One day I walked across a, a hayfield and I saw about, it must have been 5,000 ducks. They all ascended into the sky all at once from this field and began to swirl in the like a stormy sky, like a, a twister about to touch down. The clouds, they were just so beautiful. The Great Plains sky is so wide open and dynamic. These were just moving mountain chains sailing across this this deep blue sky so that's me on the final day of my walk so nice and trim i wish i had that waistline still but that's what 146 days of, of hiking <laughs> gives you and uh, maybe I don't wish for that beard. That's a 146-day-old beard as well. But that's me in uh, Port Arthur, Texas, um, which is the, the, the refinery town in, in Texas. And I remember the, the last couple miles, Port Arthur stinks pretty bad. Um, at first, it's kind of like, like your standard and vaguely enjoyable, like rotten egg stench. And then it's, slump something a little bit more unsettling, but maybe a little bit more pleasant, like a, like smoldering fireworks. And then as I got closer and closer, it, the air just felt thick and toxic. And it felt like, like imagine you have a bonfire and you have this big jug of Windex and you just put out the fire with something like that. It just smelled awful. I remember my tongue was tangling and I was like, I better not swallow <laughs> anymore. Um, but I was, I was happy to be here. I was in Mordor. I was on the last leg of my journey, and this was my, my Mount Doom, um, the Valero refinery with its billowing smokestacks and spouting towers of fire. You know, it, as unpleasing to the eye and nose as it was, like I was happy. I was I was learning, I was stimulated, I was traveling, and traveling isn't just going to see the beautiful spots in, the, in, the, on, on, in this world, it's going to places that are going to stimulate you. And I felt like to get to the heart of America, you can't just walk its forests and its fields, all the flowery places, you have to cut through and examine its industrial underbelly pull out and examine its organs, the railways and refineries, the coal plants and pipelines, America's guts. And I was right in the, in the middle of it. Looking at the tar sands and looking at this refinery, I, I, I felt something really weird. It was something I'd never expected to feel. I only expected to feel kind of a moral revulsion. But I felt something else looking over this refinery. I felt impressed. I was impressed by its size. I was impressed by its 
complexity impressed with how many workers have worked here who've built this place. I was impressed with how the human mind or a, a collection of human minds could build something so incredibly sophisticated. I was impressed not because what we've done is, is necessarily good, but I was impressed because you can't help but say it's amazing. And after just walking across my country over five months on my own two feet, I was just kind of impressed with what the human body and human mind is capable of. And I, my last thought was, if we could build this, these spouting towers of fire and these village of pipelines, what else could we build? What other future could we forge? Let me end on that note. Thank you, everybody. I'm happy to take some uh, some questions if anybody has any questions. Okay, and I'll ask everybody to unmute if you wish and uh, ask Ken uh, the questions. I have a question. <laughs> um, is there any reason why it's safer for you to be in Scotland now instead of the United States because you might be threatened by the oil companies? No, I think I was just too small beans for them. Um, and I think, I think even the fossil fuel industry has sophisticated PR teams and they at least know that they don't want to come across as as a big bully up against someone so small and, and powerless and in any ways it's it's just too many years has passed so no I, I haven't come to scotland to um to, to flee from my crimes of of trespassing or um my my advocacy against this this pipeline um and and you know the UK, we're, we're just as reliant as any country on fossil fuels. And up here in Scotland, we're drilling oil up out of the, the North Shore. So we have it. We have it here as well. And how many years ago was this walk? I finished. It was quite a few years ago, actually. It was um, 2013, actually, when I finished it. And... Um, at that point, President Obama was still in office. I think my dates are right. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it was it was undecided at the time. Environmentalists were really pushing for this pipeline to be rejected, and President Obama formally rejected the application for the pipeline. Um, uh, uh, right right before the Paris climate. Accord. He just wanted some momentum going into that and to kind of show the world that he was, you know, doing this and that. He, he obviously, uh, um, Obama retired. Clinton did not get in. President Trump was elected. One of the first things he did was resurrect the Keystone XL pipeline from the dead. However, during his four years, that did not get put into the ground. When President uh, Biden was um, became president, one of the first things he did was reject the pipeline. The only thing different about this time around is TransCanada, the pipeline company, they ended up just canceling their application. So it was kind of dead, dead. Though, as you were just telling me, there's a, there's some talks today about uh, re-resurrecting the Keystone XL pipeline, and of, of course in the political state of the world where we're really pinched by energy and everything's being thrown up in the air by this war in Ukraine. Um, I'm not, I'm not surprised to hear, uh, to hear that at all. I think what it shows is we just should have moved to renewable energy a lot quicker and a lot er earlier than, than we have. Um, I know that an alternate route to the Pacific was, undertaken the possibility of it uh 
is there going to be a pipeline from there to anywhere? Um, well, there, there already are pipelines such as the, the Keystone one and um, there's, there's other pipelines like the Dakota Access Pipeline, which came into the news a, a few years ago when Native Americans really protested that. I think the interesting thing about this Keystone, well, let, let's just do like uh, one minute pipeline history here. Pipelines first started off as wooden gutters um, when America began to extract it uh, in the 1870s, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, that's where it kind of started. From then, almost up until this Keystone XL, pipelines have more or less been uncontroversial. There was a big fight over the Alaska pipeline, but that was had nothing to do with climate change. That was more about going through like wildland. Apart from that, pipelines have been pretty non-controversial. Then comes the Keystone XL pipeline, you know, starting in 2010, 2011. And this is the first fight over a public works project on the grounds of climate change. So just from an environmental history standpoint, this fight is interesting and I think will be remembered because it is that moment where you're, you're beginning to kind of see resistance with ordinary conveyances of energy you know this this happened with you know taking oil out of sperm whales it's happened with coal plants now it's happening with pipelines it's happening with nuclear reactors eventually you reach a point where a segment of a growing population does not want this thing so i, I think this is that moment and you have what industry insiders call the keystoneization of pipeline applications. So ever since the Keystone XL fight, almost every pipeline, they don't all get rejected, but they do get a lot more pushback and a lot of them do not go through, such as that um, uh, pipeline headed to the West coast of, of Canada. So I think that's kind of where the, not only symbolic importance, but the political importance of this, this fight lies. I have a question. Well, first of all, I had the opportunity when I was in Alaska a couple of times to see the pipeline in Alaska in the interior. It kind of blew my mind to think it's above the ground. I someone could sabotage it or something like that easy. Um, that kind of surprised me. But I live in the state of Michigan, and of course, we have the big issue with uh, in, in Bridge 5 or something on the streets of Mackinac. I wonder if you can comment on that, please. I, I'm, to be honest, I'm, I'm, that has not come across my radar, or if it has, um, it's, it's kind of gone from my, my mind. But yeah, I, I live next to the Alaska pipe. I lived in Alaska for about seven years, um, and I lived right on the pipeline in this little um, truck stop, and then up in Dead Horse, which you saw some slides of, and it is amazing how <laughs> half of it is above ground because beneath the ground you have permafrost and you can't kind of set the pipe into, into ice. And it is amazing how um, non-controversial it is and how it hasn't been blown up or anything like that. And maybe part of the reason is Alaska, though not a, a progressive state, has a similar situation to what the Norwegians have with their oil reserves, which, which has gone into a, a trillion dollar um, shared public fund. Alaskans receive um, a dividend from oil revenue every year, which could range from one to $3,000, which certainly helps to make controversial projects like this less controversial when you're, when you're, you, know, you have a personal stake in it. I think that's over with my friends and they're not getting your dividends as much. Um, yeah, being in the state of Michigan, um, trying to follow it, um, they want to, the pipeline's right under the Mackinac Straits and, and they want to pump more oil through it. And the governor says, no, that could, that could break and then we contaminate our Great Lakes, be a big problem. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any um, comment on that or know more about it than I do. 
Yeah, well, well it, the, the interesting thing about these pipes is they're leak de detection systems, which they call state of the art, but f for these leak detec detection systems to be activated, I believe it's more than 2% of the flow needs to be leaking. So, you know, you can imagine that's a lot of oil leaking out if it's under 2%, if it's for a long period of time. And Bill McKibben once Riley observed that these state-of-the-art leak detection systems are oftentimes just farmers walking across the land and seeing a big puddle of, of oil. So um, yeah, it's not the greatest um, technology and these things do leak quite a bit and sometimes catastrophically with the Keystone one where there's been a couple geysers in, in South Dakota. Not to say that this is better than um, railways because um, if a pipeline shut down, oftentimes it ends up on a railway, which is less efficient and not exactly more safe or secure. So yeah, that, that's, that's not great either. Thank you. Now that you're in Scotland, how do you, what, what have you been doing to further your mission after you ended this walk? Um, it's, it's kind of been compartmentalized in my life. Like, of course, I'm still concerned about climate change. I mean, who isn't on, on some level and, you know, we do as, as much as we can as a family, whether it's wearing our, our coats indoors or trying to take as few trips as possible in, in our car. Um, but as a writer, my, my interest shifts a lot in my last book, um, which was kind of related to this. It was related to this hike, this trespassing hike. And I remember thinking, you know, it's kind of strange just how, uh, how wrong some people might perceive what I'm doing is, which is walking across grass and taking pictures and, you know, camping out under the stars, albeit on, on private property. In Scotland, they have a completely different understanding of land ownership and private property. Someone might own 5,000 acres of land, but the public is welcome to go on that land for camping, recreation, education, so long as they're doing so responsibly. It's called the right to roam or more technically the right of responsible access. So my last book, um, This Land is Our Land, um, it it advocates for a more Scottish understanding of land ownership to be brought to America, which I'm sure some of you are thinking that's really implausible because I'm, I'm thinking the same thing, but I'm thinking a hundred years in the future here. And I kind of want to lay the moral and intellectual groundwork for maybe a new, what I would say more evolved understanding of, of land ownership to take take shape. So I guess that's kind of been more my more recent work. In Scotland, I'm, I'm, I, ha I, I haven't written anything about it, but I'm interested in the rewilding movement here. In Britain, being an island, uh, a lot of species that existed here a thousand years ago and went extinct, whether it's the wolves or bear or, or the lynx, um, there's a rewild, rewilding movement to kind of reintroduce these species to the island and reforest Scotland. So when you have in your mind those beautiful, maybe not beautiful, but bleak and dramatic moorlands of um, big, empty, grassy hills, we think, oh, that's Scotland. But it, that's not like what nature wants it to be. That's because it's overgrazed by sheep and by deer and the forest can't, um, can't emerge. So there's people here who want to reforest and rewild Scotland. So this is kind of where my thinking is at the moment. And I kind of want to become more involved in maybe a literary capacity in, in that movement. Have you ever been asked to go to West Virginia or air something in West Virginia? Uh, would you be asking that because of their long history with, with coal and mountaintop removal? and all that because of joe joe manchin oh yeah <laughs> joe manchin um i'm happy there's uh, a democrat in the state of 
West Virginia. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wish he, um, I wish he voted differently sometimes, but no, I've never been invited to come to West Virginia. I'd, I'd gladly accept because it is a beautiful state, even if a few of their mountains have been removed. So if we wanted to take up an offering and send you there, you might accept. Go for it. Yeah. I'm coming through America in the fall. So yeah, save can, can pay for my gas mileage to, to West Virginia. <laughs> hmm. What's happening in Poland? I know that they, the EU has really tried to get them to say goodbye to coal, and they're trying, but it's hard. Do you know it's anything it, about? Yeah, that? well, I mean, I believe Biden this past week has kind of rejected Russian oil. Um, it's it's such a messed up situation. Like to watch, to watch the EU and NATO you know, really find their stride and really come together and, you know, uh, throw sanctions at Russia and to provide military arms and to take in refugees. It's amazing. And then it's mind boggling to think we're still paying Russians millions of dollars every day for their oil and, and gas. So it's just mind boggling. And this has got to create a shift. Um, one in we can't just do business with, with anybody, you know, we have to be more selective with the sort of politics and ethics of, of these, these countries. And I think Germany is really regretting that. Um, and I think it's, it, things are always more complex than I think they are, but I just, just kind of get angry at Germany for relying so much on Russia for its energy, even after things like, Crimea happened in 2014 or 2015. Like they, they're still doing so much business with this um, very troublesome country of, of Russia. So I don't know what the situation in, in Poland is exactly, but I think what this shows is like it, it's never possible just to kind of turn off the, the fossil fuel tap because otherwise we'd have chaos and cannibals and dogs running through the streets i mean it's just it's just such a hard thing to and slow thing to wean yourself off of but i'm hoping it really gets these countries to wake up and commit to renewables as as fast as they possibly can because a lot of them kind of look like idiots the being in the position they're in right now but a uh, hey. Hybrid cars are they are they common in Scotland or no? You you do see, yeah. My town has uh, electric charging. Almost every like rural town has electric charging stations, and I, I've been out of the U.S. for three or four years now, so I don't know what's the state of it there exactly. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I am seeing uh, just an increased um, move towards making things more sustainable. Like one thing we have here is a road tax. So I have to pay an annual tax on the car I have based on how much um, emissions it emits. So that's kind of a deterrent for getting a, a, a very high emitting vehicle. Um, and it, it actually can be a pretty big tax. So there's little measures like that, which are kind of pushing things in the right way. But then I, then I look at like public transport and there is a pretty wonderful network of public transport, but it's so expensive still. Like if I want to take a vacation up in the Highlands, I might be spending, you know, three or four hundred dollars for like a road trip, for a round trip ticket, train ticket for my family. Whereas I can spend like, you know, fifty dollars to get a flight to Portugal or something. So it still kind of makes no sense. And um, yeah, I, I wish these things were, were more affordable. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else who has a pressing question? Yep. Well, I think, um, Ken, you've given us a lot of food for thought. 
um, with your personal journey, uh, with how you felt called to do it. You know, I mean, in scripture, Paul got shoved off his horse so that he could do something and you were hit by what a broken dish and whatever else he kind of it just happened and look at how far it's projected you all these years it's amazing sometimes when you ask for one little thing it mushrooms into something much bigger so now you're you're doing you know writing and speaking and spreading your powerpoints etc I really thank you. It was about what three years ago that you contacted me first, and I, I said so, no, yeah. we couldn't do it then. <laughs> and then I heard from you again. You're like um, in our community, we talk about grace encounters, and I think that that was a grace encounter with you. I kept your information all this time, and I don't know. You connected with me again. It was just just kind of an amazing thing that happened. So I want to thank you from our whole organization about this graced encounter with you and walking across the whole pipeline. I think um, it's amazing what you've done and I hope that you'll continue to carry on with what you feel you need to do. Thank you so much. And thank you very much mm -hmm. Dave, for hosting me. It's, it's really been an honor and, and thank you for all the work you do mm -hmm. and we'll connect with your parents in niagara falls so um that was an easy way out for finances <laughs> <laughs> perfect all right well, well farewell everybody thank you ken bye-bye bye-bye okay uh this concludes the uh zoom lecture for march uh i'll ask people to consider attending our April 12th uh, SAVE lecture. We're gonna be featuring Bob Clark Phelps, PhD, senior member of tech, the technical staff at First Solar, the local photovoltaic uh, uh, producer uh, originating in Ohio. And his address is gonna be covering climate care versus climate chaos, finding our voices and charting a course. And thank you everyone for attending.